Hey there, how are you? Spatial Shark, your first video of the school year. And this is unit one, which is all about thinking geographically. So hopefully you're going to have read the David Palmer AMSCO book before you go ahead and start trying to tackle these videos throughout the year. And then after you watch the videos, then that's a good time to go ahead and proceed out to Quizlet and start completing the assignments that I'm going to give you to do where you're going to start, um, you know, testing yourself on the vocabulary and the key terms and that kind of stuff. So we'll get started here in unit one. You remember the first uh, couple of days of school, I shared with you that video from Jimmy Kimmel Live where they had this, uh, you know, easel and the map of the world. And, and you saw so many Americans who not only were geographically illiterate, they couldn't even name one country on the map, not even one. And so when we talk about geographical spatial education in this country, you know, we spend so much time thinking about math and science and reading and, and math and STEM and science and technology and engineering and math courses and, and all that's great. But remember that geography is everything and everything is geographical. So you're going to hear me say a lot and you see me sometimes when I post on Twitter or Instagram, I'll always use this hashtag why geography matters kids because without geographical education a lot of those other things just you know seemingly is not as uh, relevant without that spatial context so what is human geography you know, a lot of times you think of just political geography naming countries on a map for example okay that's great but that's very political geography and we do have a, a, a unit for that uh, but also uh, we have units for agriculture and rural land use, uh, cities and urban land use, industry and economic development, cultural geography patterns and processes, which includes all kinds of things like religion and language and race and ethnicity and gender and sexuality. And we have a chapter on population and st uh, statistics of demography and birth rates and death rates and growth rates and migration patterns and processes. So we have so much that we're gonna learn this year. It's not just physical geography. We're not learning just about the earth or rocks and soil and water and climatology and all that, but that's also part of human geography as well. Human geography is literally a course that encapsulates so much uh, knowledge that will help you not only academically, but as you go out into the world beyond Spanish River High School, whether that's college or university, straight into the world of work, into the military service, wherever you go, you're gonna see that these lessons are very important. So one of the first things we did in school, if you remember this week, is we talked about mental maps. Uh, sometimes these are called cognitive maps because cognition is your brain processing. So when you do the mental maps, these are kind of the product of your education and your experience. When you started drawing the map of the world, you probably started with North America. After all, it's what you know most. It's what you know best. Uh, when you started making the map of the school, many of you were upset because, hey, I just got here from Omni three days ago. So it's important to understand that the mental map is the product of your education and your experience. And they all have some degree of bias because you know your experiences are going to affect how you map the space around you right places that you go to more frequently will be more prominent on your map places you've never been might be completely absent from your map so please remember that maps are always kind of selective in that sense and of course your mental map being part of education not just experience you know, maybe you've never learned how big Africa is. And I'm not talking about how many square miles. I'm not talking about the distance from one end of Africa to the other. Do it by comparison, right? When we compare, we're going to do that a lot in this class this year. You know, you're kind of making some relative judgments. You know, what other places in the world could fit inside Africa, for example? How many other countries, right, in terms of their size by area could fit into that space? So I have a map here in a second. I'll show you that. Uh, where is the antipode of your current location? If you were to bore through the center of the earth, where would you come out on the other side? You know, so having a mental awareness of space around you, of the earth, is, is, is a critical first step in terms of thinking geographically. And so here's that idea of how big Africa truly is. You could take the United States. You could take China. You could take India, you could take a lot of other places and, and wedge them in. 
And, and there's a really cool website. It's called Map Fight. And you can actually compare the size of two different places. For example, look at Madagascar there off the coast. And you see that the United Kingdom, in terms of physical size, is almost the same size as the island of Madagascar. So it's kind of a cool way to kind of train your mental map to start thinking about places in the world. And of course, if you don't know much about the countries of the world, this is where that Satara website that I posted on the Bitmoji classroom wall, when you click on that world map, it'll open up a website that has all kinds of cool map quizzes. We'll do some of these this year as assignments, but you're only limited by what you're willing to do in terms of getting out there and learning about the world around you. Uh, and, and that should be a lot of fun as well. And in terms of the antipode, you've got the Western hemisphere kind of in that, I don't know if that's green, don't make fun of my disability, I don't see the colors so well. Uh, I think the light blue is that Eastern hemisphere, right? And then that kind of greenish yellowish color is the Western hemisphere, but you'll notice that they've been juxtaposed against each other so that if you were in Florida and you look at my little cursor here, if you drilled right through the middle of the earth to the other side, you'd be off the Western coast of Australia, right? So what is there on the other side of the earth? We call that an antipode, right? So it's just interesting to think about your, your mental map. And, and this is at a very global scale, but you could do your mental map at a local scale. How well do you know the streets around your neighborhood? For most kids that have been sitting in the backseat of the car with their face buried in their phone for the last few years, maybe you don't exactly know all the streets around. But as some of you start becoming young drivers, maybe it's important for you to start developing a mental map of, you know, the major roads and some of the landmarks that represent, you know, relative locations so that you can, you know, learn your way around and not get lost. And then kids will say, oh, you know, but my car will tell me. Right. I'll have I'll have GPS in my car. And you do realize that those GPS maps get outdated. They have to be updated all the time because there's road construction and roads might shift over several dozen feet. Um, in Australia, they've been having a problem where the because of continental drift, Australia is moving. And so uh, every few years or so, the lanes that the GPS thinks that you're in the lane, it might have shifted over by two or three feet. If you're on the highway and you've shifted over two or three feet and your car thinks you're in the lane, but you're going down the middle of the road, maybe that's a bit dangerous. So when you think about uh, mental maps and, and the spatial factors involved here, this is really kind of interesting. It's really kind of cool. All right. Let me tell you some map basics. All right. We're going to talk about this, of course, in class, but it's great that you guys watch these videos before. I ever start kind of teaching nuts and bolts things in the classroom, right? Acquire this knowledge before we come in and start working with what you're supposed to have already learned, right? Read the book, watch the videos and do the quizlets before I expect you to solve problems using these concepts and these key terms and those kinds of things. So when we think about the earth, you know that it's spherical. And of course, we always display the earth generally on a flat surface. And so we use different kinds of projections. And this is just like in a classroom where a teacher might take the computer screen and project it onto a, a whiteboard. Or in the case of my smart panel, right, we may have a, um, a computer that projects onto the smart panel to project it out for you to see. So we do this with the earth. We take the spherical earth and we project it onto the surface of a map. And there are a couple of different uh, projections. I'm going to show you some in just a second. There's a huge one on my back wall. Uh, when you come into my classroom, it's like the dominant thing you see. It's 10 feet tall. It's 13 feet wide. Uh, that is a Mercator projection of the Earth. And we know that the Earth has a gridded framework, all right, that, it, that allows us to compartmentalize the earth into these degrees and these minutes and these seconds of both latitude and longitude. And the latitude and longitude is almost like the skeletal framework of the earth. All right. It allows us to use absolute location. It's, it's like graphing in a math class and you have your Y equals MX plus B, you know, and you're plotting the slope of a line and all that. The, the gridded framework allows us to look at the earth in that sense. The latitude lines, they run east, west, they're, they're called parallels because they are parallel lines. They never get closer together and they never get farther apart. And they're generally shown at about 10 degree intervals, 
Okay. Now the longitude lines are different. They're not parallels at all. And that's why they're called meridians. They actually come together at the poles, right? So when you're up at the extremes of the earth or down at Antarctica, those lines are getting closer together. And that's why when you take the rounded earth and make it on a flat surface, you're going to get that horrific distortion and different kinds of projections of maps are going to have distortion in different ways. But all of these maps are going to have distortion. If it's a flat map, it lies, right? It, it, it doesn't show the correct true earth. There's only one way you can show that. And of course, that's on a globe, right? But globes are a bit cumbersome. You can't exactly stick those in your pocket, and walk around campus. But of course, on your phone, it's easy to have a map or a map software, Google Maps and Waze and all these different apps in your car, right? But they've taken the, the curvature of the earth and they've put it into a flat surface. So when we think about the longitudinal lines, they usually run at 15 degree intervals. And there's actually a compelling reason for this too. If you think about time zones, right? The earth is 360 degrees around like any spherical object. And there's 24 hours in a day. If you wanna do some simple math, you can pause this video and I want you to take 360 and divide it by 24. And when you come up with your answer of 15, now you'll know that each time zone is generally about 15 degrees wide. Russia is so big, it takes up 11 time zones from one end of Russia to the other, right? The United States, you know, we're pretty familiar, Eastern time, Central time, right? We have mountain time, Pacific time, right? But when you go to China, the authoritarian government, there's only one time zone. Everybody's on Beijing time, whether you like it or not. So the whole rest of the country has to adjust their business hours to reflect that they're on Beijing time, right? So it's interesting when you see how the earth is constructed by humans, right? In terms of this framework, the skeletal framework of latitude and longitude. So this is what I meant by that skeletal framework. And you can see here that they've got, um, you know, these latitude lines running east and west, the longitudinal lines, the meridians running north and south, right? And notice that they are either parallel or that they're coming together at the poles. The latitude is parallel. The longitude runs together at the poles. But this just kind of gives you an idea, right? And of course, this is straight up and down here. You know, the earth is actually tilted on its axis, right? By about 23 and a half degrees which is how we get the seasons, because whether you're pointed at the, earth, at the sun or not, depending on the time of year. And remember the Southern Hemisphere, their seasons are opposite of the seasons in the Northern Hemisphere, right? So when it's our summer, it's winter time right now down, for example, in Brazil. And then when we have our winter time, that's their summertime. All right. Now we talked about those projections. Here's that classic Mercator projection. And you'll, you're going to notice that the distortion here is particularly at the polar extremes, north and south. Look at Greenland. It actually takes 11 Greenlands to make up South America. So this is an extremely fraudulent projection, right? Antarctica is enormous there. And notice it looks so stretched out. But remember, when we curve that map back into a globe, Antarctica is actually, an, you know, it's, a, it's like an island. It's circular with the Southern Ocean surrounding it, right? So it's very important to understand you know, that mental map and, and that creation of what the earth really looks like. So if this map is so distorted, why do we use it? Uh, it's really the best purpose for a Mercator projection is navigation. Uh, a straight line on this map represents a, comp a constant compass heading, right? So you know you're going, you know, northeast or, you know, directly west. 180 degrees is due south. And, you know, 38 degrees would be kind of northeast, right? 90 is east. So as you go around the compass, right, this map was excellent for navigation. And then you say, okay, well, since the earth is more curved, let's take a Robinson projection. This is a different one. It's flat on the top and the bottom, but it's rounded on the sides, so it gives us a little bit of a better shape, right? But we're still going to get distortion of size and shape, right? Africa here, a bit too big, even though Greenland is now a little bit more proportional to what it should be. But then you get an even better projection. This one is a, is a goods homolazine projection. And they sometimes you know, say this is like a kindergartner took a pair of scissors and cut out all the water. But by removing the water, you're able to more accurately 
depict what the land looks like in terms of size and shape. So all of these are just competing different kinds of projections. All right. And there are websites that will show you uh, hundreds of different projections, some of them now computer generated that are all seeking to accurately display the earth and how it looks. So what are some types of maps? This is one of the first things we're going to do in class is we're going to talk about different types of maps. This is topic 1.1. Reference maps. If I go to Disney World and I get a map of the park and I look at it because I want to plot out, oh, I want to go on Space Mountain and I, and I definitely want to go over to you know Big Thunder Mountain, that's a reference map. I use that map to refer to it so I know my way around. I could look at a map of a state park and I could see where all the hiking trails are and I could see the elevation of, of the hikes, right? But I can't use that map to tell me, you know, how many people have ridden that ride in, in, today? How long is the wait time, right? How long is the average wait time? Uh, how many people visit that park? on an annualized basis. I don't know that information. It's just a reference map that allows me to study it, right? So that I have an idea of the, 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 the dimensions of the park, for example, right? The size of the park. I can see that on a reference map. But a thematic map is gonna tell a story. And this is the important thing. Oftentimes, maps will have a title. And if you read the title, it might say something like population statistics by county. Okay, what's this map going to be about? It's going to tell me about population and it's going to be at the county level. So whenever you see a title, it's very important that you always read that title of that map so that you can get an idea of what it's showing you. All right. There could be a map that says, you know, percentage of people who have a college degree or it might say number of automobiles sold in Palm Beach County from 2017 to 2020. Right? And so we have a, a title that tells us what is this map going to be about? We could look at how many people live in China or India, compare it to Canada or Australia. They have some cool maps called cartograms where the size is uh, proportionally shifted to be able to represent whatever story it is we're trying to tell. Some maps are choropleth maps. They use colors or shading. That happens a lot with political uh, electoral geography. Uh, for example, showing the results of elections in terms of the electoral college votes. And I'll show you some maps like that in just a second. We have proportional symbol maps where the circle gets bigger, right? When, when there's more of a geographical phenomenon. Could be a dot map where every dot represents one or 500 or 5,000 of a certain phenomenon. So there's all kinds of cool maps. Isoline maps. This is, looks like a plate of spaghetti where you've got all these lines, these squiggly lines. And you see this on the weather a lot because they're showing you temperature ranges. And wherever those lines go, they connect areas of equality. Every time you cross a line, you're changing values. So, you know, these maps can show us quantitative data, right? They can show us qualitative data, uh, stuff that's collected by the census, for example. All kinds of things can be displayed on a map. But remember, all maps are generalizations. And what that means is that those generalizations are going to be selective in the kind of data that they are going to show you. All right. So here's that cartogram I was telling you about. Uh, you can see that, you know, here's China here in the yellow. Again, don't make fun of my disability. Could be lime green. Looks like a highlighter to me. India looks a little more orange to me. But this is China here. This is India here. And I said, okay, we can compare it to Canada. Canada almost disappears there. It's that little tiny strip. And here's Australia. <laughs> kind of looks like it's massively distorted because what they've done here is they've made the size of the country on the map proportional to its population. And remember, I told you guys the other day, you know, if you draw that circle over East and Southeast Asia, more than half of humanity lives there. You draw this circle here. This is, this is more people in this area than the entire rest of the world combined. And so on a choropleth map, you might see this as shaded colors or something like that. On a dot distribution map, you might see dots all over the place. This is a cartogram. And the, the size is going to indicate 
overall population. You can see Brazil is the most populated country, for example, in South America. You can see Nigeria is the most populated country in Africa, right? You can see that Germany is the most populated country in Europe, right? You would, of course, need to know on your mental map where these countries are in order to be able to do that. Okay, I mentioned electoral geography. So this is the result of the last presidential election. But this data is being displayed by state, right? We have 50 states. And so you can see that if the state is blue, it, it went for Biden. If it's red, it went for Trump. And, and of course, at first glance, you see a lot of red there. But remember, a lot of those states have very small populations. A lot of those blue states have bigger cities and cities tend to be a little more liberal voting, whereas rural areas tend to be a little more conservative voting. And of course, we know that in most of these states, the winner takes all in terms of the electoral votes. Only Maine and Nebraska proportionately allocate their electoral votes. So you can see, for example, that, you know, Georgia, Atlanta is a big urban population. Georgia went blue for the first time in a long time in the last election. OK, now watch what happens when I take the same data. It's a true map, but it's a false impression because I can take that data and I can change it to show this by county level. Now, the state borders are still there for you so that you can see it. But now what we've done is we've shown the data county by county by county within those states. And we changed it a little bit so that it's not just red or just blue. We've made it so that a lot of the country ends up looking purple or violet. And so what you're doing there is you're saying, OK, if it's purely red or purely blue, then every voter voted one way or the other. But if it's purple, it means that there was some portion of the county that voted differently than the majority. And as you can see, most of the country is pretty purple. There's very few places where it's either all red or all blue. Now, of course, one thing they might ask you to do on the AP exam is what are some of the limitations of this map? Well, for example, Alaska doesn't have county level data available. So we couldn't make any judgments about Alaska below the state scale. We wouldn't be able to do that because we don't have that data. OK, um, and, and, and another limitation of this map, it shows us the results but it doesn't tell us why people voted this way. What was their big issue? Was their big issue something about um, you know, the economy? Was their big issue something, for example, about COVID? Was their big issue something about uh, immigration? Was their big issue something about you know, any other political wedge issue that happens to divide Americans and cause us to have political leanings one way or the other? Okay, this is a choropleth map. It uses colors and shading to show us this data. So the one important thing here is that we need you to remember that this class is always about patterns and processes. Okay, so the pattern is what you can see. When I just showed you that last map, you could clearly see that urban places were more blue, rural places were more red, and I talked about that. That's the pattern. The process will be what is the explanation of that pattern? Why is it like that? One thing you'll notice about this class, and I'll say this a lot, pretend that there's like a four-year-old taking the test with you because you know what four-year-old kids always do? They keep asking why, why, why? And if you think you've written an answer to why, you need to read back through it. And if you still have a question, you need to keep writing because you always have to explain. And when you explain, you're talking about how and why. So when we see maps, we know that maps can indicate direction. We know maps can show things like clusters, right? Especially like a dot map can be clustered or those dots can be dispersed. They can be spread out. We know that maps can both ask questions and answer questions. They may use a map as a visual stimulus for you on a test question. When you guys did the pretest the other day, you saw a couple of maps. In fact, there was a choropleth map, right? That you had to answer based on what you saw in terms of those patterns. But then of course you use the map to be able to formulate answers to your questions. Nowadays, we have a lot of technology as well. And so we use GIS and GPS. They're different technologies, two different technologies, but they're used similarly. GIS, for example, you take geographical data, geospatial data, usually quantitative data, values and, and numbers, 
and you compute that in or you type that into your computer and it generates a map, either core pleth or dot distribution proportional symbol, some kind of map that's going to show you those layers on the map. I always say it's like lasagna and you can tell by looking, I don't miss too many meals and lasagna is one of those things that I love. So when you have a, a spatial data layer, you might have a base map on the bottom and then you might configure other layers of information on top of that base layer. We're going to do this a lot in class this year. We're going to use a website uh, that, that utilizes geospatial data. And this is very important because a lot of companies nowadays, when you have that job interview, they're going to say, have you ever worked with GIS? And your answer is going to be yes, right? Which makes you more marketable out there in that job search because you've worked with geospatial data. You understand how to think geographically, which is what unit one is all about. Now, GPS, a lot of you guys are more familiar with this is like a pin on your phone. You drop a pin and it, and it gives you a precise absolute location and it uses remote sensing, it uses satellites, right? And it can tell you an accurate, usually within about a couple of feet, it can give you a pinpoint location on the earth. So a lot of this is what we call distantiated perspectives. So this could be like, you know, realty companies using drones to take pictures of houses and things like that. That's remote sensing. But GPS is a satellite based system that allows you to pinpoint locations on the earth. And this is what I meant by layers. And so, you, again, you'll have a base layer. And for example, when we start going into agriculture, I might be able to allow you to turn on layers where you can see what type of crop is being grown, how much water has been used, uh, how much fertilizer or pesticide has been applied. We can put all of that data into a computer and layer it and then display it, right? Some of you have used Google Earth before and you know that you can turn on and turn off layers. Sometimes even on your phone, you can turn on and turn off layers. If you're in your car and you're looking for a place to eat, you can take the GPS in your car, the, the navigation screen, and you can actually turn on and turn off layers. Show me all the restaurants. Show me all the retail stores. You know, show me all the gas stations. You're turning on and turning off layers that are showing you that geospatial data. Now, when we look at data, we have to have a spatial perspective. Right? So we have to look at these things through the lens of a geographer. It is thinking geographically, like I've been talking about this entire uh, video. So what does the word spatial mean? Why am I spatial shark, for example? I thought it was alliterative. I thought it was cool. The word spatial means geographical. And we are the sharks, right? So I'm spatial shark. And everywhere you find me, except on YouTube, because I don't know why they wouldn't let me be spatial shark on YouTube. Uh, I'm merely Kevin Turner, my alter ego out there. But if you find me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, I'm spatial shark, right? If you go find me uh, all over, uh, you know, anything to do with AP human geography, it's usually spatial shark, right? So, but that's what they look at. They, they look at a spatial perspective. Again, patterns and processes. The pattern is what you see, and the process is the explanation of what you see. For example, if I show you a map and I take a dot and I show you every single Starbucks in the United States, would you see a pattern? I think most of you know spatial, uh, you know, a Starbucks is spatially concentrated in big cities. If you walk through New York City, for example, you'll find pretty much a Starbucks on every block. In your Boca Town Center Mall, you can find not one, but two Starbucks locations. So how does Starbucks decide where to expand, where to, where to locate? They don't just randomly pick places. They don't just blindfold themselves and throw darts at a wall map and say, there's a good spot. They utilize their business acumen. They do their market research. They collect data quantitative and qualitative data to make decisions about locations. And every company does this, right? This is how Amazon does their logistics. It's how Walmart grew to be the biggest company in the world. Uh, they utilize geographical spatial analysis. And this is why geography is everything and everything's geographical. It's a great career move to understand geography. It's a great class you're going to take this year and it's super relevant, right? Yes, it's rigorous but it's super relevant. Uh, during the lockdown, right, we saw that some of these restaurants and stores that sell, you know, things like coffee or, you know, um, you know, places to go eat, 
because of the lockdown and because of the, you know, the um, unwillingness to, you know, be mingling with other people for safety reasons, a lot of places closed. They could not keep themselves open because they lost so much revenue. That's what we mean by spatial perspective, right? Spatial analysis. So uh, I mentioned geospatial data. It's being, it's really important. Companies want to know who their customers are. They want to know where potential customers might come from, all right? They want to use their money in the best way possible to maximize market share, to maximize their profits, to maximize value for their shareholders. And of course, you know, we can collect quantitative data, right? Like a census, it can count things, right? But it also can be qualitative data. And by qualitative, we mean that it's not just numerical, right? We can ask people their feelings about things. You know, people who get off of a cruise ship, we can say, you know, how did you, did you like the food, right? Did you like the ports that you went to? What kinds of activities would you like to see in the future? All right, companies collect qualitative data in, in addition to quantitative data. And then they'll use that to make economic, social, cultural, political, and environmental decisions, right? The government does this because they're providing services, right? Uh, companies do this, right? Any people make these kinds of decisions all the time. And again, at multiple scales, you might make a decision on your own at a very local level. And, and the president of the United States might be making decisions at a national level. And the governor of a state might be making decisions at a regional level. And, and that's what's so important about this course is thinking about things at different scales of analysis and being able to look at patterns and processes. All right. So when we think about ESPN, dun, 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 right? <laughs> so uh, the, 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 the kids that are big sports fans, they're like, yeah, ESPN, ESPN the Ocho. Uh, but no, we're talking about economic, social, cultural, political, and then you have to work with me on the end, environmental. This is everything about our class. It's everything about our subject, right? You see the pattern. What's the explanation? I guarantee you it's going to be something economic, something social, cultural, something political, something environmental. What's the number one reason why anybody in the world migrates? Because they think they're going to have a better life. They think it's going to be better for them. You know, economic reasons are the number one reason that people move in the world. Some people move for political reasons. You know, they have a bad government. They're being picked on or persecuted. That happens too. Some people move for environmental reasons, right? It's too cold in the north or they're climate refugees and they're getting away from, you know, volcanoes or earthquakes or whatever the case may be. And sometimes they move for social cultural reasons. They want to be near family, right? They want to be with people who are more like them, speak the same language, worship the same faith. But this is what we mean by ESPN. It's always the explanation. It's the why of where because we really ask two questions in this class all the time. And you know that that's always the first step now in the scientific method is you ask a question, right? This class is a science. It's all about curiosity and asking questions. So where is the locational analysis? It's the pattern part of it. And the why there is the process part of it. It's the how and the why that helps us explain. And then I love that little extra part. Why do we even care? You know, when you think about Starbucks locations, why do you care? Well, if you want a cup of coffee, you know, maybe you care how far away you are from a Starbucks, right? If you want to think about, you know, test scores across Palm Beach County or Florida or the United States, you know, maybe you care about the distributions of those scores and how it connects to economic, social, cultural, political, and environmental factors. You know, I'm a big soccer fan. You guys know that. You know, there's a great book, How Soccer Explains the World. And, you know, we know we see a lot of movement of players from, you know, less economically developed countries to more economically developed countries. Players from Asia and Latin America and Africa migrating to places like Europe, right? And, and especially African players. And you're seeing this all across the European leagues, right? Regardless of what European country it is, you have a lot of young black players who will leave Africa as children sometimes and will go into the academies and will go into the team setups of these big, powerful clubs, right? So for the clubs, it's a cheap 
talent source because those players are not going to command huge salaries. They're coming from very poor places. It allows them to develop talent rather than going out and spending big money on talent that's already been developed. But here's what happens. Think about this. Why do they sometimes go to the Belgian league or, you know, the, the, the Slovak league, right? Or the Belarusian league or the Ukrainian league. Why do they go there before they drop into La Liga in Spain or the premiership in, in England? You know, those leagues are where the biggest, best players are and the most money and the most famous teams, right? Generally speaking, the players are going to try and break in in a lower division, right? And then the big clubs will say, hey, this player has potential. Let's go snap them up. And some of these lower teams and lower leagues, this is a, a source of revenue for them, right? So they have scouting networks that they're trying to develop these players and hoping to sell them on for a huge price. So we know that geography is all about doing field work. It's all about doing research. And the pioneer of this, uh, the one who really started this back in the 1800s was a guy named Alexander von Humboldt. His name is actually all over the earth. There's a Humboldt current. Um, there's all kinds of references to Humboldt in physical geography. He actually traveled the world back in the 1800s. And he was very instrumental, for example, in South America, cataloging the flora and the fauna and, and discovering the animals and the plants and looking at climate and, and, you know, writing all this down, keeping these big journals about acquiring information about the earth. And he has a very famous quote, which I really love. And it, it's it, the idea that the most dangerous worldview is the worldview of those who have never viewed the world. Right. And, and this is why. As you guys know, we like to get kids out of Boca Raton. We like to get kids out of Palm Beach County in Florida. And, you know, we've been very lucky to go to China and Peru and Egypt and, you know, South Africa, as well as to Europe repeatedly and, and show kids the world. And, you know, obviously we want to be safe doing it. But at the same time, you can't sit and learn about the world only by looking at a book or only by listening to some slightly overweight, you know, diabetic guy talk about the world. You really need to get out there and see it and, and taste the food and hear the language and, and observe the customs. You know, you embed yourself in this study of geography. Of course, medical geography is big, too. We all know this in the world right now. But historically, geography became a very important part of what we call medical geography or epidemiology, the study of how diseases move across time and space. And in the 1850s, there was a cholera epidemic, an outbreak of cholera, which is a waterborne illness in uh, London, in the UK. And uh, a guy named jo Dr. John Snow uh, convinced the local authorities. He plotted a circle, a red dot represented every fatality from cholera. And he noticed a pattern, right? He noticed a clustered pattern. Remember, we talked about clustered and dispersal and all these things that you're going to see as you go through unit one, thinking geographically. And he said, well, look, every one of those P's is a water pump. And there's a concentration or a clustering around this pump at Broad Street. And he convinced the authorities, shut that pump down. Don't let anybody get water anymore out of there. Cholera comes from contaminated water. So when that pump was shut down, lo and behold, the cases of cholera dwindled and went away. So this is what we mean by medical geography, thinking geographically, right? How can we be healthier? And so certainly this still has applications in the world today. So you can ask students, right? College students, as they're about to graduate, where would you prefer to live? Now, this is not quantitative data. This is more qualitative data because you're asking them for their opinions, their feelings, well, it turns out that Californian kids would prefer to stay in California. And I think that's true of a lot of people. What you know is more compelling than what you don't know. But I think there's a lot of other reasons for this. California kids might like the weather. They might like the sunshine. They might like the beach. They might like surfing. They might like that lifestyle out there in California. They don't want to go to Arkansas or Louisiana, right? Or the Redneck Riviera on the Florida Panhandle. Yes, there are beaches there but maybe that's not really compelling for them. You'll notice that they are okay with New England, which is interesting because very different climate, but maybe politically the climate is similar. 
California tends to be a little left. New England tends to be a little left as well. Whereas the Great Plains, right, and the Deep South tend to be a lot more conservative. So maybe that's an issue there. Okay. Maybe the, the surfing and the skateboarding translates to the snowboarding in Colorado. So, you know, you use the map to both ask and answer questions. And by the way, this is that Isoline map that I was telling you about. Every time you cross a line, you're changing the data of what you're showing. Okay. So then you ask, okay, where do Pennsylvania kids prefer to live? And ironically, what, what happens here? Yes, close still matters. And pretty much the deep South is also equally unattractive, right? But you notice that California is pretty attractive. South Florida is pretty attractive, right? So maybe these, some of these Pennsylvania kids would prefer to get away from the cold. But again, it's economic, social, cultural, political, and environmental factors that are always making up these patterns, okay? Now, you might have heard somewhere in a social studies class along the way, the five themes of geography, right? Location, place human environment, interaction, movement, and regions. Recently, uh, many of the geographical educators in this country have said that the five themes are kind of being replaced by instead what they call six essential elements of being able to think and be able to be geographically literate, right? So I, I want you to take a second and you can pause the video. I'll give you a second to pause it. And I want you to read through these six things and I want you, you know, remember you've got your composition book and, and you're doing your K and your W and your L. What do I know? What do I want to learn? What did I learn? This is a great way to think about that KWL and reflect on what you're doing as you read the David Palmer book, as you watch these videos throughout the year, as you work on your Quizlets, as we do the work in class, right? This is where that growth occurs. All right, so that you're going to be prepared to take that really rigorous college credit exam at the end of the year, but also just so you learn something about geography. I'll give you a second. All right. So now that you look through your six essential elements, we can go to the ideas that are in there. And, and, and I kind of kept these along the lines of the five themes, location, place, human environment, interaction, movement, and regions. But I want you to walk through, and this is a lot of your vocab, a lot of your Quizlet key terms are going to be embedded in here. Anything that's in italics, you're going to see that that's kind of one of your key terms. And of course, they're all in the David Palmer book. You know, you're, you're able to read about these things. And what we're going to look at here then is location and, and real estate people will tell you that that's their joke. You know, there's only three things that are important about when you buy a house, location, location, location. Absolute location is precise. It's like an address. You know, you might live at 1602 Woodchuck Avenue. You could tell somebody that it doesn't really help me understand where that is. I do know that that's the absolute location. You can give me coordinates. If you're in the marching band, they have to keep these little dot books. And, and whenever the music stops, they're, they're always saying, okay, check. And they look down and like, oh, I'm one foot off. And they move over. You know, that's absolute location. Relative location is your location relative to other things. You know, how much space is there between you and the next person in the band? How much distance is there between you and the grocery store? Could you walk or would you need to drive? You know, how much space is there between, you know, the richest and the poorest right? In, in, in a group of people. That's what we mean by relative location. It's the description relative to something else. And certainly connectivity and accessibility has something to do with that. And remember that these things nowadays can, can be technological. If you're in my remind, you're more connected to me than the kid who's not in the remind. Even though you may be in Boca and I'm not, you can text me and boom, I get that text immediately. Now remember distance and direction can also be absolute or relative. And that's important to remember as well, okay? How far is it? Well, are we talking about miles? Are we talking about hours? Are you on a plane or are you walking, right? Um, you know, direction can be relative, right? You, you know, I'm getting closer or I'm getting farther, right? Distance and direction. For example, absolute location. When we took kids to South Africa, 
you know me, I'm, I'm a nerdy geographical person. Whenever I see a sign that's got, you know, coordinates, I'm all over that. Uh, and this is when we took the kids down to Cape Point. And this is the southwesternmost extreme part of Africa. Uh, later that day, we went and saw penguins on Boulder Beach. I mean, you're, you're not that far from Antarctica at this point. It's the closest I've been. Remember, that's the one continent I've never been to. So when you think about, you know, absolute location, that is a pinpoint location. But I could also tell you that that's about an hour away from Cape Town, right? I can tell you that it's roughly south of Cape Town even though it's really kind of southeasterly if you look at it on a map, okay? So that's absolute. Meanwhile, this is relative. You guys remember the story of the three little pigs and one built his house out of straw and one built his house out of wood and one built his house out of brick and you know the big bad wolf came and huffed and he puffed and whatever. Well, in this one, the joke is that he's building the tough house that the wolf can't blow it down but it's right next to the sausage factory, right? And, you know, the pork and, you know, you have to work with me on the jokes here, but location, location, location. If you were one of the three little pigs, why would you build your house right next to the sausage factory, right? So make sure you know how absolute and relative location work. Now, this is something you'll hear me say a lot, and I want you to just burn this into your brain. There was a guy named Waldo Tobler. He's dead now. Famous geographer, famous American geographer. And he, he had this kind of saying that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. And this could be like sports rivalries. This is why the Yankees and the Mets, Arsenal and Tottenham, you know, those two stadiums are really close together. I'll tell you two stadiums that are closer, Everton and Liverpool. You know, you can stand at the top of the stadium and look out across Stanley Park. You see the other stadium of the other team. They're literally both in the same area of the city of Liverpool. So when you think about relationships, and there's a big part of our class, it's all about relationships. Everything's related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. But remember, that's both absolute and relative, okay? So two areas that are connected can seemingly be closer together than maybe what they really are in the world. Now, we do have a lot of models in this class. You're going to think that this is like a fashion show. It's like, mm, 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 mm. and they're, here they come down the runway, right? We have a lot of models because what do models do? Models take something complicated and they simplify it so that it looks something like what we can use, right? And think about it. Models, they, they, they model fashion. They model clothing. This represents what we might look like. It's what we could look like. It's rarely what we actually do look like, right? And, and yet, at the same time, in geography, we're going to take models of very complicated concepts. And by putting it into a visual, it's easier to understand, right? So be prepared as we go through the year. Uh, to some degree, Toblerisms are basically like a model. It's a way to explain interconnectedness through distance, right? And, and in terms of accessibility and connectivity. So one of our other themes here then is the word place. Place, of course, is all about characteristics. And you're gonna notice that I used the word describe there. On the AP exam, describe is gonna be one of those big words, right? You have to give us plural characteristics, more than one thing. It could be human characteristics. It could be physical characteristics. It could be about the environment. It could be about culture. It could be about money. It could be about government, right? ESPN, da na 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 and so we build a sense of place because of our emotions, because of our feelings, right? When we walk through a mall, we might think that, oh my God, these malls are all the same. That's what we call placelessness, right? It doesn't really have a difference. Most every neighborhood in Boca is the same. You guys know what they look like. You drive in on a curved drive. Sometimes it goes up a fake hill and there's a guardhouse right? And, and there's all kinds of the greenery and probably fountains and things. Almost every neighborhood looks the same, right? Different names, but very similar appearances. That's what we mean by placelessness. Suburbanization of America is very placeless. But when you go to like ground zero in New York City, the site of 9-11, there's, there's a reverence there. There's a somberness there, all right, that builds a sense of place, right? You get a feeling about that place when you go there. We have a lot of descriptive words in geography. Toponyms are place names. 
So like the Rocky Mountains, I don't know, what kind of mountains are they? They're very rocky. Oh, let's call them the Rocky Mountains. So when we think about toponyms and toponymy, the study of place names, remember that that is a way to describe place. The name can give it away. And, and of course, you can practice this, right? If you've been to New York City or even if you haven't, what is your perception of that place? What is your sense of place of New York City, right? A city of almost 8 million people, right? Very busy, a lot of traffic, car horns and those kinds of things. That's the sense of place. When you think of China, right? And, and what do you think about the sense of place or Africa or the earth as a whole, right? Remember, there's always bias. There's always stereotypes. And we need to understand that as geographers, we sometimes have to get out of those stereotypes, right? And don't paint everybody with the same brush, right? Because a lot of times people say, oh, Africa, a lot of poor countries. You know, there's billionaires in Africa, right? There's places in Africa that are very uh, developed, very high income. And, and yet there are also places that are extremely poor. But the same thing happens in Palm Beach County, right? We've got very high average incomes, but we can also find areas that are very low income, right? So be careful how you think about your sense of place. Now, distance decay, time, space, compression, these are very similar terms, uh, but it's always about, for example, transportation, communication. Distance decay is the idea that the idea is going to diminish the farther that it travels. And this often happens, for example, like with religions. The source area of the religion is where it's strong, and as it gets farther away, it generally gets weak. Um, if it's time, space, compression, this is where, because of, you know, communications, technology, TV, internet, you know, texting and video conferencing and all that, we connect places more than ever before. And it seems like, it seems like time and space are being compressed. And so cultural change is always going to be accelerated by these technological advances, whether it was the printing press, you know, the first book published was the, was the Bible. And so Christianity spreads through that technology. Assimilation is when people are kind of forced to, to change. Acculturation is when people change by choice and they pick and choose. They don't necessarily take on all of the identities uh, of the other group. So when we think about cultural change, uh, the spread of disease can be a catalyst. When European colonizers came to the new world and they introduced diseases for which the natives didn't have any natural immunities. And, and this led to the terrible idea of, hey, let's bring over slaves from Africa. And when enslaved people came to the New World, that changes the culture of the Western Hemisphere. And those effects can still be felt today as well. And so you think about colonization. It was economic, right? Mercantilism, the triangular trade. It was social cultural, right? Languages spread. Many European languages today are amongst the most widely spoken languages in the world. English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, they're killer languages. They wipe out indigenous identities and, and Christianity spreads. And so you think about that political ideas like parliamentary representative democracy, it spreads. And like environmental ideas spread, you know, um, the, the idea of, you know, climate change and, and not using plastics and things like that. This can all spread. And so certainly as Europeans moved around the world, they incorporated a lot of these ideas. So when we study the spread of culture, we need to think about distance decay, but also remember that totalism I told you, everything's related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. All right. Um, obviously technology greatly reduces the impact of distance on those things. And this is a little schematic. You can see this. The top one is a very standardized distance decay model. And then the time space compression model below it is the idea that with technology, that distance shrinks. So what about the pace of cultural change? We know that distance affects that. It took thousands of years for farming to move around the world. Remember 10,000 years ago, everybody was a hunter gatherer. And then people started growing their food. Um, industry took hundreds of years to develop and spread around the world. Today, globalization is happening not just in, in decades or centuries or millennia, but in months and weeks and days and sometimes even in hours. Things can change overnight because of the viral nature of so much of this technology. And a lot of this is facilitated by networks, people who, for example, are on TikTok, people who have the app, 
those people are connected in ways that people who don't have a TikTok are not connected. And of course, that contributes to this time space compression. So I'll give you an example. All right, look up, go search up Dean Scream. Howard Dean was running for president and he gave a speech in Iowa at the end of the night of the caucuses in which he had not done as well as had been predicted. And at one point during his speech, he had an unfortunate moment of exuberance and it's called the Dean Scream. So if you go check it out, you can probably find video and audio of it. Uh, after that night, his candidacy for president pretty much died right there in Iowa uh, because people kind of looked at that and they said, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> and I, it, the perception of him as a candidate changed because of that one moment. And it happened like that. It didn't take weeks. It didn't take months. It didn't take decades. It was instantaneous. I always like to use this as, as an example of what I mean by Toblerisms and, and time space compression, all that. You know, Walt Disney was right. It really is a small world after all. It took Columbus three months to cross the Atlantic Ocean. You and I could get on a flight in Miami tonight and we could wake up and have breakfast in Europe tomorrow. Time space compression. The world is still the same physical size that it's always been. That hasn't changed. But the relative distance, right, has really been altered by technology, right? So it really is a small world after all. Human environment interaction. This is, of course, pretty self-explanatory. And this is how do we interact with our environment around us? How does the environment interact with us? Sometimes this is known as cultural ecology. And certainly we talk about a lot in science classes, but also just in general, it's a big conversation in our country and in our world today about sustainability. How long can we continue to live this way? Many people are advocating that we need to change our behaviors, you know, electric vehicles and recycling and solar power and, you know, cleaning the water and cleaning the air, taking the plastic out of the ocean. All of this is kind of that human environmental interaction part. Now, Theoretically, it used to be a lot of people said the environment determined your culture. They, they call that environmental determinism. That's largely been discredited. Uh, in some ways, it's almost racist to think about, you know, people would say, oh, the reason why white Europeans took over the world is they had geographical luck, right? The reality is that it's, it's more of a possibilism. Uh, human innovation allows us to overcome the limitations of our environment. Uh, in, in many ways, today is a, a world full of possibilisms as, as we invent new ways to, uh, to live our lives. But we are still kind of Goldilocks-ish, right? We like it where it's not too hot, not too cold, not too wet, not too dry, and not too rocky or mountainous. And we'll talk about that as we get into unit two. So this is a lot of what you can see of how human geography is very much interconnected with the environment around us. And, and I mentioned just a few of those things, energy, for example, and ecosystems. But look at how population growth affects that. Um, you know, big cities with slum populations, you know, farming with genetically engineered foods, uh, using biofuels, uh, right? Ethanol, for example, which is made out of corn, uh, looking at health and the spread of disease, uh, but also rising living standards as people make more money, but then they use more water, which leads to drought. And then, of course, we worry about conservation and things like that, uh, travel and tourism. And, and sometimes people take the money and they send it back home where they came from, which is a big part of migration. So there's so many things here that are interconnected in our class. You can really take a second to look at this. Mentioned plastic a second ago. So this is interesting. 95% of all the plastic that's in the oceans today has come from just these 10 places, these 10 river valleys in the world. And you'll notice that most of this is Asia and Africa. And these are places in the world that are less well off economically than where you and I live. But it's interesting because I can't get a plastic straw anymore, right? We're getting all these paper straws and listen, that's fine. But the reality is you and me with a plastic straw is not really the problem. And, and ironically, I always wonder about this. When they bring me that paper straw, a lot of times it's in a plastic wrapper. So it's like, wait a second, you're trying to get me to stop using the plastic straw, but you're giving me a plastic wrapper. 
But when you think about most of the plastic pollution, it's coming from places in the world with less well-off economic systems that are heavily industrialized. And of course, rich people in this part of the world are buying the products that people in the poorer parts of the world are making for us. Our shoes, our clothes, right? Our electronic components, our cell phones, and all those kinds of things. It is a real case of interconnectivity. It really is a small world after all. And then you look at something like, you know, terracing. Uh, this is in Southeast Asia where they grow a lot of rice and it's very mountainous, volcanic. It's very vertical hillsides. And so long, long time ago, people started to innovate and they started to cut into the hillsides and create these terraces that actually preserve and collect the water without allowing it to run away. And they, and they keep the water into these uh, rice paddies where they can grow the food that they need to support. Remember Asia with that huge population, the 10 biggest rice producing countries in the world, all in Asia. So this is what we mean by human environment interaction, right? We're, we're modifying the physical environment to bend it to our human needs and our human wants. A lot of times in geography, we talk about landscape analysis. Humans interact with their climate and their physical geography, like I just showed you. But the physical environment is natural, right? Not man-made. What happens when we change it? This is what we then call the cultural landscape. It's sometimes called the built environment. And as a geographer, you should be able to walk down a street or look at a picture and you should be able to interpret using your spatial perspective and your spatial analysis. You should be able to look at it and read it to understand who are these people? What are they like? Is this a wealthy area? Is this a poor area? Is this an area of a particular language? Do we see signs on the street that reflect that language or that identity? Do we see any evidences of religion? Do we see any symbolism on the landscape? Do we see anything political? Do we see any kind of control, whether that's things like speed limit signs or, or, you know, laws about parking and laws about bicyclists and pedestrians and things like that. So when we think about landscape analysis, it's all about reading that landscape. And of course, we can see things like ethnic neighborhoods, you know, areas of big cities where a particular nationality group uh, congregates because they like being near people who are like themselves, or maybe they were forced to be in those areas. Right. Um, you think about Chinatown, for example, in, in many of the California cities, San Francisco being a very famous example. Right. Uh, they, they, they huddled together for convenience and for comfort and for security. But at the same time, the, the, the population of California didn't exactly welcome them with open arms and say, hey, let's all mix together. Nobody in California said, hey, let's all learn Chinese and let's become Buddhist and let's all become just like the Chinese immigrants. It didn't happen that way. So when you look at, for example, sequence occupants, you know, a lot of Cubans immigrate into Miami and Miami-Dade County. And so what happened is over time, there's this sequence occupants that the cultural landscape of the city changes. Street names change, right? 8th Street, Southwest 8th, Southwest, uh, Southwest 8th Street becomes, you know, Little Havana and it becomes Calle Ocho. And you can go down there to Versailles, which is like the most famous Cuban restaurant anywhere in the world outside of Cuba. And the Cuban uh, exile community is, is down there every night of the week. So when you think about this, this is what we, do, what we do when we read a landscape. And that is, of course, meaning that you've got to get out there. You can't just read about this in a book, although there are plenty of sources where you can read about these things. And you can certainly go out on the Internet and see these things. But wouldn't it be a lot better if you just got in the car and drove down there and said, hey, let's go down there and, and, and let's try some croquetas and, and, and let's have some cafe cubano and let, let's embrace that, that culture. Let's learn about it. Let's, let's learn a few words in Spanish and, you know, let's uh, taste the food and let's smell the smells and the viejos that are down there playing, you know, dominoes and smoking their cigars. That's how we get an idea. You got to get out there and do some field work. You got to get out there and travel. For example, read this landscape. 
this could be anywhere in America. I mean, it's basically fast food. And there's a reason why Americans tend to be fatty boom laddies, right? And so when you go down any kind of suburban road in America, you're likely to encounter these kinds of things. Now, can we read this landscape and look at some of the physical things? Can I tell from the trees, for example, that I'm probably not in a cold climate? This is probably a pretty warm place, right? So we can start to use some of our clues right of our of our context here and we can start to get an idea of where we might be we're going to have a little bit of fun with this in class now look at this landscape a little bit different than the one i just showed you right clearly most kids could figure out and this is probably not in the united states anymore the architectural style is different we generally don't have animals in the street um, the transportation systems are different Hey, we're on bikes, we're on motor scooters, we don't see a lot of cars, right? Maybe the clothing could be, remember, appearance of a person is a poor predictor of who they are, but clothing is a pretty good predictor of who somebody is. Um, so when you think about this, and I'll tell you, by the way, this is in India, um, you know, you look at internet service, for example, the language is English. Remember that India's colonial language was English. But if you go to India today, there are hundreds of different languages being spoken uh, throughout India, different language families, different languages, different dialects. English has been considered one of those bridges amongst different Indian communities, and the government certainly promoted that. Uh, today, Hindi is becoming almost like that language, uh, a lingua franca, a language of business and trade. Uh, that's replacing English, even though most educated Indian people still will have a great command of the English language. But this is what I mean by reading that landscape. So how does that landscape change over time? Certainly, in today's modern world, we see tall buildings. And what do tall buildings always mean? They always mean that there's money there, right? Big banks, right? Gigantic investment firms. So how do we read that landscape? We look for individual businesses. I mentioned the fast food, for example, on that previous picture. It reveals the economic activity. We can see evidence of people's cultural style right, on that landscape. Sometimes uh, we see authenticity or the reality of a place. And then we see the places that are fake. Right? You go to Las Vegas, for example, you can find an Eiffel Tower, you can find a Caesar's Palace, you can find all of these places that they have replicated and then, and then, of course, Disney does this as well, which sometimes leads people to say, oh, you're culturally appropriating these people's identity. You're basically using their culture for your own economic gain. And a lot of people get angry about things like that. For example, sports teams have recently been forced to change their names because they uh, appropriate Native American identity. The most famous example recently, all right, the Cleveland Indians are going to become the Cleveland Guardians. The Washington football team has dropped their former name, and they've gone so far as to tell fans, we're not going to allow you to come in with headdresses or face paint or anything related to a Native American identity because they're changing that look, right, because of the inauthenticity of it. So landscapes can change over time. Uh, certainly, New York City's landscape changed over time. Remember 9-11, the terrorist attacks in New York City. The Twin Towers are gone, and now there's Ground Zero, where they have created the memorial. But in the, uh, in, in the replacement of that Twin Towers comes the Freedom Tower. And ironically, you know, it's 1,776 feet high. That wasn't an accident. That's on purpose. It's 1776. It's the Freedom Tower. And you can go to the top, to the observation deck, and you can look out over New York City. Um, but this is an area that the Dutch, you know, built this. Back when it was New Amsterdam, they bought the island from the native population. Wall Street was called that because they built a wall for protection. And today that's the financial center of America. Um, but a lot of times you can walk through New York City, lower Manhattan, and you can find, for example, Trinity Church in the shadow of the old Twin Towers. And George Washington went to church there. <laughs> when he, remember, when he was inaugurated president, the Capitol was in New York City. Washington, D.C. didn't exist yet. So the changing landscape over time. And then, of course, all the immigrants came in and they came in through Ellis Island and they saw the Statue of Liberty and they worked in the factories in Brooklyn. And, and you know, then they migrated out across the country as we grew and, and that westward expansion. But all over the world, we now see tall buildings. And ironically, 
Most of the tall buildings are not in the United States. They're not even in North America. There's only 16 buildings in the top 100. But look at Europe. Europe only has one. And by the way, it's the Shard in London. There's, you know, most of the laws in Europe were that big, tall buildings couldn't be taller than any of the church spires. So Europeans never really built these big skyscrapers. It started in America. By the way, Chicago, the first one's not in, in, in New York City. But look, Latin America, Oceania, they only have one tall building each, right? And that's mostly because just lack of development in those areas. But look at where the money is, because you want to talk about the money of the next century. It's in the Middle East. It's in Asia. Uh, there's a great book, uh, Parag Kana wrote a book called The Future is Asian. And, and you look, 48, half of the tall buildings in the world, all in Asia. When we took kids to China, we went to the top of the Jin Mao Tower. It's 88 stories tall. At the time, it was the tallest building in Shanghai. Today, it's like the eighth tallest building in Shanghai. It, it's, it's unbelievable the pace of change. And this is just in the cultural landscape. So... Scale versus scale of analysis. Now here we have to think about this as cartographic scale. How much of the earth is the map showing? And you might see something here like, okay, one inch equals a hundred miles. And so you can measure and, and you can see distances and all that. That's map scale, right? A large scale map is gonna show you a small area and a small scale map is gonna show you a large area. It's like an inverse proportional relationship. So if I want to show you Spanish River's campus, that's a very small area. Everything on that map gets big. The 8,000 building, the courtyard, the shark, all that. What if I zoom out and I show you all of Florida? What happens? Now a bigger area, what happens to Spanish River's campus on that map? It gets tiny. We can't even see it because it's a map of all of Florida. So a large area is a small scale map and a small area is a large scale map. But that's map scale. What we want to think about a lot in this class is scale of analysis. So it's not really the map we're talking about. It's the data that the map is showing. So if I'm going to show information at the county level, that's kind of local to us, right? If I show it at the country level, it's a national scale of analysis. If I show data for all of South America, right, that's a regional scale of analysis. And yes, I could show global statistics, but let's be honest, what are we doing? Comparing it to Mars, right? If we were to show global COVID data, for example, I'm pretty sure there's no COVID on Mars, right? So global data is almost worthless to us unless we're looking at like global temperatures or something. Yeah, that becomes a little bit of a relevancy, but we're not comparing the earth to anything else. So we do compare regions and we do compare countries and we do compare below the country scale, what they call subnational. We do make those kinds of comparisons. We compare local areas. We might compare, you know, Boca Raton to Delray Beach, right? Two local communities, but that's scale of analysis. And it's really important that you guys can differentiate between map scale, right? Like a map of the United States, but then I might show you that data in different ways. You remember earlier in this slideshow, I showed you political uh, geography and I showed you the results of the election. And I said, you could look at this data by state or you could look at this data by county and you might get a different picture, right? Because the state would be generalized all red or all blue. But when I change the scale of analysis and only show you the county data, you might see that even in a red state, there's a lot of blue or even in a blue state, there's a lot of red. It's a true map. It's a false impression because the scale of analysis is really what matters. Now, I'll give you a second to look at this. Remember, I just said large area, small scale and a small area is large scale. And, and my, my little picture there is probably covering up the fact that that says large scale behind me over here. But this is what I'm talking about. On the left there, you've got the entire eastern half of the United States plus Canada. It's a huge area, but look at the circle. The circle in each of the three pictures is the exact same area. That doesn't change, but we're zooming in, we're zooming in, we're zooming in. You know how like if you take a picture of yourself, right, your face is big in that picture. But let me take a picture of the whole class. Let me get everybody, panorama, right? And, and now everybody gets smaller. So a large area, small scale. A small area, large scale, 
right? So when we think about map scale, that's what this is. This is not scale of analysis. It's just map scale. It's cartographic scale. And I can do the same thing here. I've got a map of all of Washington. You see the red box? That red box becomes this map. It's the area around Seattle, right? And then I could go over here to this map where I'm now in downtown Seattle. And then you see this little box and now look, oh, I can see just a few blocks downtown. Look at the numbers, 10,000, 100,000. This one is 1 million, this one's 10 million. The bigger the number, right? The smaller the scale, right? A large area, small scale. A very small area is a very large scale map, right? So I know it's gonna be a little confusing, but that's cartographic scale. Scale of analysis is way more important to us in terms of looking at data. Let me talk about that. As you know, this recently became big, big, big in our world, this idea about COVID. And the year that COVID really started to spread, COVID-19, all right, there was already websites, and this is that Johns Hopkins famous website that was showing you the data. They would show the data at different scales of analysis. So you can show this as global cases, right? But notice that the data is being shown by country. We can see a number for the whole world, but it's being broken down country by country by country by country. So even though it's a global map, it's a country scale of analysis. It's a national scale of analysis, right? And, and certainly you could make some decisions based on that. But watch this. If I change the scale of analysis, now I've got a map of the United States, but I'm showing the data by state, right? So I'm showing California, Florida, Texas, New York, Georgia, Illinois. So this is a sub-national scale. I'm showing the data below the country scale, even though it's a map of the entire United States. The scale of analysis is more local than that, right? Because if I'm living in Florida, I don't really care about Montana. And people will say, well, why are there more cases in Florida? You know, there's like a couple hundred thousand people in Montana. Palm Beach County has more people than all of Montana does. Of course, we're gonna have more cases than they do, right? So when you think about data, what are the limitations of that data? What does the data tell you? What does the data not tell you? Okay, that's important to think geographically, which is what this whole unit has been about. And then of course you look at just Florida, but notice that we're, we can now do this by county. When you click on each county, it would give you the data for just Palm Beach County, Florida. Now that's a really local scale of analysis. I'm able to compare Palm Beach to Broward, to Miami-Dade, right? To Orange, to Hillsborough, to Duval, wherever in Florida I want to compare. That's what we mean by scale of analysis. And then we look at regions and, and we classify, categorize based on these common characteristics. And those regions can be formal, which is sometimes called uniform. When guys go to a formal event, we, we generally wear tuxedos. Everybody looks the same, right? That's what a uniform is. Everybody looks the same. The Yankees wear pinstripes, right? So this is an area with some commonality, whether it's a human or a physical characteristic. If it's a functional region, there's some sort of activity and the activity will be focused on a nodal region or a nodal point, right? The node is the hub of the activity. So that's like a network. And then we can have perceptual regions which are kind of in our heads. We use our own uh, characteristics to define it and everybody would be slightly different. That's why the boundaries can be fuzzy. They sometimes call these vernacular regions, right? Like the South, you know, everybody would define that a little bit differently. Is it just places that were Confederate States? Is it places where people talk like this, <laughs> right? Is it people where, is it where you can get sweet tea and a smile? right? That's, that's what we mean by a perceptual region. And sometimes countries can suffer from regionalism. Certainly we've had that issue in the United States in the past, but it happens in other countries as well. Uh, for example, in Spain, people who live in the Catalan region of Spain right, have, have long kind of had this idea of separatism and independence from the rest of the country. And that can, can cause political problems. 
And, and of course, regions can sometimes overlap, right? Because we could say Asia is a region, but then there might be Southeast Asia, South Asia, Southwest Asia, East Asia. There's not really a North Asia because that's just Russia, right? But when we think about that, that they overlap to some degree. Now, this is Quebec, and it's one of the provinces in Canada. This is a formal region. It is defined by a boundary, and there are some common characteristics here. For example, those of you who know anything about the Québécois, je me souviens, right? That's what their license plate says. What does that mean, je me souviens? It means I remember. What is it that you're supposed to remember if you're a Québécois? It, it's supposed to be that you know that you're French, that you have a French identity, that you have that Acadian culture. And by the way, a lot of those French Canadians, after the French and Indian War, when France lost, they left British Canada now, and they came around and settled in Louisiana. And this is where, when I went this past summer to Lafayette, Louisiana, to do that APSI, that's where we get that Cajun identity down there in Louisiana. Here's another formalized region. Now, this one goes across political boundaries, but the formality here is climate. This is the Sahara Desert. It has a, a formalized name. It's a proper noun. And, and it basically connects all of the areas where the desert is the dominant climactic feature. A lot of people know the Sahara. What a lot of people don't know is that outside the Sahara, there's a grassland there called the Sahel. And that is also a formalized region. Okay, so this is what we mean by formal regions. You can map them. They have a common characteristic. A functional region might be commuter zones where people get in the car and they drive to go to their jobs, right? So uh, usually there's a limit to this. There's a boundary to this. Uh, it's a critical distance. I might be willing to drive an hour to get to my job, but I'm not going to drive three hours. That just is kind of ridiculous, right? So when we think about commuter zones, this is an activity. A zip code is a functional region. If you call the pizza restaurant and you want them to deliver to you and they say, oh, I'm sorry, we don't deliver into your neighborhood. It's not part of their functional region. It's not part of their nodal region. And of course, the hub would be the restaurant itself where the nodal region is anchored by that hub. When we think about perceptual regions, you know, this is, you know, they break down the United States into perceptions that Americans have about places like New England or the Midwest, right? Or Cascadia in the Pacific Northwest. These are all examples of regions people in America think exist, and they attribute certain characteristics or qualities to the people that come from these areas. Now, in the AP Human Geography course, right? There are several regions that they want you to know. They're going to they're gonna ask test questions based on this regional analysis of the earth. You're basically breaking the earth down by common characteristics. And so you might see North America, right? South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Europe. But what if we change cartographic scale here or change our scale of analysis even, and we see even more localized regions like South Asia, which includes India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Bangladesh, right? All of the areas of South Asia, Sri Lanka too, right? The island off the coast of India there, that's South Asia as a sub-region of Asia itself. Okay. The same thing here. We might say West Africa. Most of these countries were colonized by the French. How can we see the legacy of that even in the world today? You see countries like Cote d'Ivoire, right? Where the name of the country is in French, right? Even though the people who live there today may speak an indigenous tribal based language, generally speaking, Historically, their educational system might have been in French. The government might operate in French because there's a French colonial legacy, just like Brazil being Portuguese. You know, there's more Portuguese speakers in Brazil than there are in Portugal. Portuguese is one of the largest regions of the world, our largest uh, languages, I should say, of the world because of the colonial heritage of Portuguese people moving to South America and establishing Brazil. Right? In Brazil today, the biggest Portuguese speaking country in the world. But it's not the only one because you can hear Portuguese in Mozambique. You can hear Portuguese in, in Angola. You can hear Portuguese even in the Pacific realm, 
right? As you get over into places in the archipelagic states, like in Indonesia, where you still have some uh, legacies of Portuguese exploration and colonization. So this is what the college board wants you to be able to see, is how to break the world down into these different regional analyses. All right, that's it for unit one, right? And, and again, you don't have to watch these videos all at one time. Just because I sit here and make one video from beginning to end doesn't mean that you need to be able to watch all of it at once. If you want to make popcorn and invite friends over, God bless you, you can do that. But you can also chunk this and you can watch a little bit at a time. All right. And so maybe what you do again, you read that book, you watch these videos, you do the Quizlet when I assign it. I haven't done that yet, but you're going to get out there and you're going to acquire all this knowledge. And then we're going to come into class and we're going to do a lot of fun activities where I'm going to expect that, you know, these concepts, these key terms, these these patterns and processes. And then we're going to come into class and we're going to actually work on them. And we're going to learn a lot about the world, about your country, about your local area, and about how geography is everything and everything is geographical. Until next time, be healthy.